I'm radio and television host Jimmy Church, and I'm here to uncover the truth about some of life's biggest mysteries. If this is revealed, everything has to be rewritten. My guest today is Jacques Vallée, an astronomer, computer scientist, and ufologist who has exposed hidden secrets about what is possibly the first UFO retrieval. This object comes out of nowhere, the size of two trucks, and crashes in the bushes. Technical assistant Josh. Josh, can you pull up the map? Yeah. Also joins us to help set the scenes. Join us as we deep dive to get to the bottom of some of the most intriguing questions of our time. Is our government in possession of a craft that was made not on planet Earth? Welcome to Into the Vortex. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, and today, computer scientist Jacques Vallée is with us. Josh, you excited? Ah, oh, I've been a super fan of you for a long time. I've read multiple books. I'm super excited for this conversation. Thank you. Jacques, if I may, I want to start here. You've been uh, pursuing knowledge about what may be visiting us for over 50 years, but the Trinity case is not your first case. You've been looking at uh, other things. And, and when you think about it, how does Trinity rate with some of the other cases you've investigated? Well, what got me started, as you may know, is that as a kid, and young, want to, you know, wanting to be a scientist, I had an observation of my own with two other independent witnesses in France. And for a long time, I thought, well, the, this may be a new device that's under testing or under development. And then when I started working at Paris Observatory as an astronomer, tracking satellites and computing orbits and so on, I realized that there was nothing in the sky like what I had seen. So that started me getting information from other scientists, from other people who reported to us. And I realized that there was a much larger problem than anybody had realized. And then I started using my training and using computers to try to find out what the patterns were behind the phenomena. Do you think that over the last, as we get into Trinity, over the last four or five years uh, with the revelations that have been coming forward nearly daily over the last five years, is this starting to validate your past research and in some ways a vindication of your past research too? It's more than that. I, I think of all the people I've worked with over the years, you know, Dr. McDonald, Dr. Dr. Hynek, of course, with the Air Force, Project Blue Book and so on, who are waiting for this day when the stigma would be removed, you know, when people wouldn't be laughing at the problem, but they would stop taking it seriously. And when scientists would join us, because there are only, you know, so many things we could do with the resources we had. And now, you know, Dr. Avi Loeb at Harvard, uh, Dr. Nolan at Stanford, and I work, you know, closely with him on trace materials and so on. We have a lot of data that now can see the light of day, and that's, that's a wonderful day. One of the things uh, that you started to present uh, to the world and to our community uh, very early on was th this contact in these craft may not be what we want them to be. There may be something interdimensional here. There may be something else. There may be a connection with our consciousness to what may be happening too as well. This case isn't, you know, from that side of the fence. How do you feel about that? And is it something that conflicts with your past research? It doesn't conflict. It um, validates past research, not only mine, but that of many other people who've looked at crashes or close encounters. Uh, the case in Socorro, and there is a similar case in Valençol in France. In all three cases, they, there was a, a thorough investigation by the state, not by, you know, a UFO group or volunteers or people like me, 
but by by the, the, the French government, for mm -hmm. example, in the case of Valençal, by the army and the air force, Project Blue Book, and Dr. Heineck in the case of Socorro, where we in the book we brought new. Uh, new descriptions, new interviews that nobody has seen before about Socorro. Uh, in all three cases, it wasn't a disc. It wasn't a flying saucer. It was an egg-shaped object. Let, let me jump in. Josh, pull that up. We have a, a, a drawing here. This is part of your research. And obviously, there's a similarity here between not only Socorro um, and France, but today, some of the descriptions of the Tic Tac in that we are dealing with an oval. This isn't a flying saucer, it's not a triangle. It's a very descriptive uh, craft. And and here it is here. Does it remind you of not only modern phenomena, but uh, back to Socorro? Certainly, you know, again, my background is in computer science and in, you know, looking for patterns and applying artificial intelligence to complex patterns in, in, in science. Here, you know, it's inescapable. And when you look at one case, is there is no one case, whether it's Tic Tacs or anything else, that's going to convince the public, that's going to convince the academy. What is going to be convincing and move us along is looking for patterns, looking for statistical patterns on a large number of cases, which, as you know, I've done, mm -hmm. but also looking at specific patterns on the ground where we can have intense investigation over weeks and months and investigation of the materials that are recovered in all three of these cases and more cases that build a picture that we can show to scientists that will convince them there is a phenomenon there. So in the new edition uh, of your book that you uh, wrote with Paula Harris, Trinity, um, We've got new witnesses and, and more information that, is, that has come forward. But what Trinity, I think, represents uh, for me is the possibility of this being the first crash retrieval and one of the first times that uh, the Department of Defense and certainly there in New Mexico where so much uh, high-level security stuff was going on at that time to have a crash retrieval happen that predated Roswell is, is extraordinary. Were you surprised by that? Everybody was surprised. The, the witnesses hadn't spoken for 60, 65 years. Why? You know, the, the Air Force hadn't spoken. Well, there was no Air Force in 1945. There was an Army Air Force. The planes you're going to see were Army planes, and the pilots had Army uniforms. The object was taken away. We know it was taken away first to White Sands and then to Los Alamos. And there, there is no trace of it after that. Okay. It's an object that was the size of two trucks that took 10 days to remove from the site where it crashed. Actually, it was a, a controlled crash landing that they made. And we have all the details now because finally, uh, no, Paola found the witnesses and got them to speak on the record and then brought me into the case to continue the research at the site and the analysis. Before we get to that, um, let's kind of set the stage on, on how everything unfolded. Uh, we had initial witnesses, uh, again, the Army Air Force. And here, Josh, we have an image of, of a pilot, um, and what can you tell us about this image and who was he? So this was at the, right at the, the end of, the, of World War II. This pilot was coming in for a landing. This was a month after the explosion of the first atomic bomb. So a uh, no, great historic moment. History changes at that point. And he's coming in for a landing at Alamogordo, which is inside the White Sands area, which is very, very large, where they had detonated the first bomb. The tower asked him to check a communication system that's on a, on, on a communication tower at the north end of the range. The tower has been hit by something and it's, the communication is broken. He circles that communication tower, reports that it's bent and it's out of commission, 
And then he sees some smoke in the brush and he sees an egg-shaped object. There's no saucer in, any, in anything in the book. He sees a, an oval object the size of two trucks with burning brush around it. And he sees two kids, two Indians on horseback. They're not Indians, but from where he is, he assumes that they are mm -hmm. Indians guarding the cattle there. And then he makes a landing and, and uh, gives a report on what he saw. So we can place everything at that inception of the case, which we cannot do in Roswell. In Roswell, if you remember, the, the traces, the object was seen a couple of days later after searching in the desert for the crash site. Here, we can place everybody at the crash site. I have to jump in here because we need to understand the location because yes. with the timing of a witness like that, a military pilot, we have the location, we have the date, and we have the time. Yes. Josh, can you pull up the map of uh, where, where this occurred? And if you can help us understand, Jacques, what we are looking at. So White Sands was, of course, a secret area where Project Manhattan um, it installed all the equipment and for the detonation of the first atomic bomb. It happened in July 1945. One month later to the day, this object crashes in San Antonito. That is the, the bottom red uh, dot that you see. Jacques, so the elephant in the room for me here is we detonated the first nuclear weapon and then one month later, a UFO crashed. Now, anyone who's researched ufology realizes there's a connection between nuclear weapons and UFOs. I think Trinity was a signal from somewhere that you think you're clever with your technology. Look at this one. <laughs> yeah, it was Try a big to moment. to figure it out. Yeah, yeah.